Now, the news tonight is about how this hearing will run. All the Republican members of the Judiciary Committee are men, and they made an issue of that fact today by announcing that a woman will handle the questions on Thursday. Now, Majority Leader McConnell did not appoint a woman senator to the committee, which he could do. That'd be one way to do it. Instead, announcing the hiring of a woman lawyer for this job, and Republicans assert that she is an experienced sex crimes prosecutor, which may be true. I would love to tell you about how we fact check that. But the Republicans have made that impossible for us to do because they're not even, and this is a little weird, releasing her name tonight. So there's no way to publicly examine the questioner's record for those of us in the newsroom. There's also no way, and this could be important, to prepare witnesses for how that person will approach questioning, which is normally done, obviously, in the Senate as well as in court. Now, these are the same senators who also have refused an FBI probe into Dr. Ford's accusation, saying they, the people on your screen, can handle it. And now, in a way, they're saying they at least cannot handle or don't want to handle part of it, the live questioning part. Now, we want to give you some context. There are some precedents for this, times where a committee relies on someone other than the senators to ask a question. It's rare. It occurred, for example, with attorney Fred Thompson. He was the official minority counsel for the Senate Watergate Committee. And if you remember, as many people do, the dramatic questioning back then, he dealt with some of the questions because of their complexity and the details involved in the probe while senators stood by and watched. That's what you're, what you're witnessing there. This, though, obviously doesn't look like that kind of case where someone with a long-term subject matter interest, like the official counsel for the committee, is dealing with topics. My job is to report to you the news, but when it looks bad, I have to tell you it looks bad. This looks bad because it does look, unlike the Watergate precedent, more like a method for the male senators to avoid catching heat, political pressure, criticism for the way that they might push the accuser, an issue that, of course, came up in the 1991 hearings when Anita Hill testified. Here's what one Senate Judiciary Democrat has to say about all this. I think this is an example of the Republicans uh, on the committee not wanting to reveal themselves to the American public. The Republicans do not want to question Dr. Ford directly because they will reveal uh, who they are, and I think they're afraid of that. It will reveal who they are. Now, that is a political statement in the middle of a big political brawl over the Supreme Court, but it also runs to the heart of what are we preparing to witness on Thursday? Is it an investigation? Is it congressional oversight? Is it the advise and consent power responsibly exercised? Or is it something else? Now, you hear the senator there talk about what's revealing. Many critics are saying Donald Trump is further revealing himself by going after a new woman who stepped forward, Deborah. Ramirez, uh, excuse me, Ramirez, I should say. And she's a Yale classmate of Kavanaugh. And she alleges that he exposed himself to her. And she says she is now in contact with the Senate Judiciary Committee to determine the best process to provide senators with additional information. Now, here's Trump on that. Charges come up from 36 years ago that are totally unsubstantiated. He said she was totally inebriated and she was all messed up, and she doesn't know it was him, but it might have been him. Oh, gee, let's not make him a Supreme Court judge because of that. She admits that she was drunk. This is a con game being played by the Democrats. So that's where the president is. There's also news breaking late tonight, as so much news seems to break at this hour. A source telling NBC News, this is new, that Senate Judiciary staffers had a call with Brett Kavanaugh today to explicitly interview him about these new allegations from Ms. Ramirez. Now, Kavanaugh has denied them, but that tells you there's movement on whether there's going to be a widening discussion of accusations. That's a big deal. Then you have Senator Lisa Murkowski, a key Republican swing vote, asked if the FBI should open their investigation further. Well. Guys, we got to clear up now, guys. It would sure clear up all the questions, wouldn't it? It would sure clear up all the questions said, running through a doorway, but an answer nonetheless. Then you have Senator Lindsey Graham. You may remember that he's often styled himself as a kind of a moderate, even a kind of a conscience for the Republican Party, at least on issues like Guantanamo. Well, here is his message to the Republican Party now. 
Why didn't the Democrats come forward in July when they found out about it? What I would say to Senator Murkowski is that this process has played out because of what they did, not because of what I did. Are you really innocent or guilty based on the accusation? If the accusation is enough, God help us all around here. This all comes as other people are speaking out. Kavanaugh's former roommate said to the New Yorker magazine that he recalled Kavanaugh being frequently and coherently drunk and that he believes the second accuser saying, based on my time with Brett, I believe that he and his social circle were capable of the actions that Debbie described. Now, Kavanaugh denies those allegations, and that is more of a character witness than an underlying allegation. But as it stacks up, the question for the committee is at what point is a promotion in question. I want to play some more of Kavanaugh's side of this, but first let me introduce our panel of experts tonight. I'm joined by Erin Carmona, senior correspondent at New York Magazine, who broke the story on sexual harassment allegations against Charlie Rose. She's the co-author of a book that I've said around here I like, The Notorious <laughs> RBG, Life and Times of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Caddy Kay is an anchor for BBC News in Washington, and Elisa Menendez, a contributing editor at Bustle. Uh, I'm going to get to everyone, starting with Irene. Take a look. Uh, at how many times Kavanaugh really tried to slam the idea in this Fox News interview that he wants a fair process. I am looking for a fair process. All I'm asking for is fairness. All I'm asking for is a fair process. Just asking for a fair process. Again, I'm just asking for a fair process. I want a fair process where I can defend my integrity. I want a fair process where I can defend my integrity. I just want a fair process. I just want a fair process. I just want an opportunity, a fair process. We're looking for a fair process. So what I'm hearing is he wants a fair process. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I would ask Brett Kavanaugh, you are a learned man of the law. Why does a fair process not include a neutral record, fact finding? Why does it not include speaking to investigators? Why is this hearing as of now only taking place with two people? Uh, one of whom has an allegation and the other of whom denies it. So if you're not going to interview the other person that uh, Christine Ford puts in the room, if uh, you're prejudicing the results, you're prejudging the results by making statements like we're going to plow through to a vote or I'll listen to the lady but let's hear her out, is that due process for Dr. Ford? Is it even due process or a fair process? I mean, it seems like Republicans are making it up as they go along. Now they're saying they're going to have an investigator, excuse me, a prosecutor whose identity they won't release. It, it makes it seem like um, they can't even help themselves. They can't help but say something sexist or insensitive to victims. And they realize that a, a big portion of America is finding these allegations credible. So they're going, are they going to sit there? during these proceedings, stony-faced? You know, is this going to be an illustration to their base that white men are being silenced? I don't think anybody understands what this is going to be like, but to me, it does not look like a fair process. It does not have the markings of a fair process. Uh, Caddy, speak to that, a town that you've covered uh, for some time, that when a woman walks into this Judiciary Committee hearing on Thursday as the first Republican uh, representative, uh, she will not be a senator. She will be a staffer. Yeah, and actually, by the way, Mitch McConnell may have a point that they should worry about how this is going to look because he this afternoon called the woman in question, who I believe is an expert in the field of sexual harassment and is a prosecutor herself, um, a lawyer herself, he called her an assistant. So that may be some indication of perhaps well, the kind think, of mistake that I think the you Republicans raise an important point. would like to avoid. And as Kanye West would say, I'm going to let you finish, but since you brought it up, let me play Mitch McConnell for your analysis of that quote. Let's take a look. Today, all men, everyone on the Judiciary Committee, all men, you don't have women making decisions about Judge Kavanaugh. What message does that send to the American We're looking for the truth here. We have hired um, a, a female assistant to go on staff and to ask these questions in a respectful and professional way. I think she makes the coffee afterwards as well <laughs> for all of the male senators. Um, look, this is their problem, right? And this is why they have made this call that they can't be the ones standing there. I mean, I actually gave them the benefit of the doubt, thinking it wasn't what was coming out of their mouth that they were worried about. It was just the optics of the fact that you had 11 men sitting there. Having heard Mitch McConnell um, this afternoon, it makes me think that they needed to worry about the tone of their questioning as well. Uh, and to build on your point for both you and then Alicia, let's look uh, just at the historical evolution here. We have the percent of Republican women, I'm going to put this up, on the Senate Judiciary Committee in 91 during those uh, only similar precedent, the bruising hearings questioning Anita Hill. Now, we're going to reveal for viewers here 
That's the percent today. It's the saddest pie chart I've ever seen. I feel bad for your graphics department that they, that they were asked to make that. But to this question of, you know, Brett Kavanaugh saying that he wants fairness, he was explicitly asked whether or not he thought an FBI investigation was the right way to go. And he responded yet again with what I want is fairness, really trying to stay away from specifics. And to your point about the optics, you have Senator Corker saying, well, if I were on the Judiciary Committee, I wouldn't want to ask questions because someone's going to say something that you guys, meaning you, cable news, are going to run 24-7. So there is some awareness on their part that they could step in it. At the same time, they have the president of the United States, the leader of their party, degrading a woman who has come forward with these allegations. So I'm not sure that they are going to save themselves simply by having a woman ask these questions. I think the bigger question, you know, besides the Republican Party's optics on this one and what they might say, is what are these hearings actually going to achieve? Because my the growing sense is that both sides, frankly, are going into Thursday with their minds made up. Um, is there any anything that she could say or that he could say, barring something extraordinary that would actually change any minds. In which case, why are we doing this? And what we need to be doing, as everybody is saying, and as even Lisa Murkowski has now come around to saying, is having a proper investigation. That is the only way in this very partisan environment with these midterms coming up that we have any chance of getting to the truth. And even then it's going to be difficult. But at least give the professional investigators a shot. I mean, if there is going to be an investigation, it's going to be because of Lisa Murkowski and, and Susan Collins. And I think <clears throat> as partisan and as polarized as this is, there are still persuadable votes, right? There are red state Democrats who are sort of standing there with their finger in the wind trying to figure out which way it's blowing. Um, everybody is looking for signals. And it fascinated me that after a week or so of saying no FBI, no FBI, the FBI doesn't do that, today the National Review's Jonah Goldberg ran a story saying maybe we should look at the FBI. And I take that to mean that they cannot count on Lisa Murkowski and they cannot count mm -hmm. on Susan Collins. And that as we get closer to the hearing and uh, Dr. Ford has called their bluff and is showing up and is negotiating terms and all along maybe they were hoping she wouldn't show up, they now realize that this is not going anywhere good for them. Well, I think uh, you make such a good point because that's why this is uh, not theater, although I think uh, Caddy's Washington season skepticism is very apt, which is to say this hearing could be a joke and a farce based on the trickery, but it could also be the thing potentially that changes everything if some of these swing centers on the Republican side see and their constituents see enough evidence, right? This is not the criminal yeah. standards we've emphasized on this show. Nobody is, is up for going to jail here. Just enough evidence to say this promotion should be in doubt. And, and to that effort, I want to show Susan Collins here now. I want to be very clear as we try to be precise for viewers about what we're seeing. This is Susan Collins before the second accuser came forward. So this is uh, her view of things when it was uh, only Dr. Ford, uh, courtesy of an interview done through Showtime. Take a look. Senator McConnell seems to be suggesting he has the votes. So if he has the votes, he must have your vote. Are you, I, still, are you still undecided? I am. How could I decide before hearing the testimony of Professor Ford? So is Christine Ford the only thing that leaves you undecided on him? I'm close. I'm very close. But I'm not all the way there yet. And Professor Ford deserves to be heard. That is her hanging it on Professor Ford. Yes. You're making a face. I can't, well, I can't quite tell what face you're making. <laughs> well, I think that she's, she is repeating what the Republicans have said all along. Professor Ford deserves to be heard. But when she says, I'm close, I'm very close, but I'm not quite there yet. What more could Professor Ford say in that hearing that would mm. change her mind? That's my question. Professor Ford has laid out her story. We know the parameters of what she's going to say. Um, I guess the only thing that could happen would be that she would be very plausible and Brett Kavanaugh would come across as implausible or say something that was detrimental to his case. Well, uh, since you pose it Again, in, I find that hard to believe since, since he's so prepped on this. Since you pose it in the form of a question, which is sort of supposed to be my thing, but we can, <laughs> we can all do it. You can't invite three journalists and then expect <laughs> answers. I will hazard an answer for the Go. sake of argument, uh, mm -hmm. as the lawyers would say when they're being annoying arguendo, uh, which is to say I don't necessarily believe this. But one answer to you would be uh, that if the process works, putting her under oath before a government committee under the penalty of perjury and the criminal sanction that comes with that, I mean, ask Rick Gates or George Papadopoulos uh, what happens when you lie and you get caught before 
the government, that that is a higher standard than her speaking to the Washington Post. And so if she does that, that alone it makes it more probative, again, I'm sounding like a super lawyer, than simply speaking in public. Yeah, and I guess the same applies to him too, right? Mm -hmm. That he will have to answer very specific questions um, and speaking to that body, mm -hmm. even the counselor, is going to be different from speaking to Fox News. What I find more interesting than Colin Sound is Corker saying that there are more of us than you think there are. You keep saying there are a handful of Republicans who want to hear the testimony right. and what he called the rebuttal, but there are more of us and we're a silent majority. That I think is something. So you talk about a silent majority, you think about the majority of voters being women, you think about how the Senate still is not representative of the gender diversity of the nation. Uh, here's some of the pressure I want to show that we dug up locally on Senator Collins on the issue. Senator Collins says she has yet to make her decision on Judge Kavanaugh. Delay the hearings until the information comes out more. Their goal is to get Senator Susan Collins to listen to them. I was concerned with him before this all came about with Roe v. Wade. They also delivered letters with signatures from sex assault victims. I really want her to know that women are counting on her. No new statement from Senator Collins, who has been the target of dozens of protests and a $1.5 million fund for her future opponent, should she help confirm Kavanaugh. Where does that pressure fit in? I mean, I think it means that she has to at least acknowledge this testimony, sit there and consider it, and have a very good rationale coming out of that testimony for why her opinion has either stayed the same or has changed. Yeah. Uh, look, we learn a lot from each of you, and I, I suspect as this story continues, uh, we'll be hearing more from each of you. So thanks. Hey, I'm Ari Melber from MSNBC. You can see more of our videos right here, or better yet, subscribe to our YouTube channel below. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here with us, and we appreciate that.